I, I'll do a quick introduction to this event and then I'll share an intro to R&D, uh, one of the hosts of this event, and then Ethan Pelle, one of our board members at R&D, will uh, chat a little bit about the movie. So thanks everyone for being here. Um, we're super excited to host the second annual um, R&D Earth Day event, this time co-hosted by March for Science New York City. And we're excited to welcome panelists from NOAA and uh, sorry, Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, so R&D is a nonprofit that uh, funds clean tech research for a sustainable and carbon-free future. Um, I'll go ahead and play a quick introductory video on R&D and then we'll come back and learn about the movie. It's already having devastating impacts on the environment, the economy, and ethically. What if we were to deploy every single solution today? Would that solve climate change? Well, obviously not. Today's technology can't stop climate change. Wind, solar, and electric vehicles can only take us so far. We're still left with major questions like, how are we going to fuel our airplanes? And how are we going to manufacture iron, steel, and cement, which collectively contribute 15% to global greenhouse gas emissions? So let's just develop new technologies, right? It's actually extremely difficult to obtain funding for technology development. Different phases of the development process have access to different grant opportunities. Many of those grants are backed by the government, which puts clean tech development out of reach for individuals who want to impact the future of our planet. I'm Emily, the board president for a nonprofit called R&D. We recently awarded a grant for sustainable aviation fuels research to scientists at the University of Kentucky's Center for Applied Energy Research. Let's hear what they have to say. My name is Eduardo Centillion Jimenez. My name is Great Moeke. I am Dr. Robert Pace. The ease with which we're working with R&D has been both surprising and, and refreshing. Where R&D is really different is that they are more interested in funding fundamental science. Uh, they want to give people the money to come up with new ideas, essentially, instead of funding work that has already started. And, and so that's really refreshing because fundamental science is something that gets ignored so much in terms of funding that it's really difficult. If you've got a great idea, it's really difficult to get the money to develop that idea. And R&D is a really excellent and really cool organization because they are willing to take that risk and fund that. It's actually a dream come true working on catalysis at the Center for Applied Energy Research. I really find myself privileged to be working with um, people of such experience and people of such great willingness to help. I really find that encouraging. Really appreciate the opportunity. Even when we just started working on this particular project, the relationship that we have with them as a funding agency has already profiled to be a pretty pleasant and productive one. It's also, we need that fundamental science. We need to get those ideas because it, it really does cost money to do science. To me, climate change represents the existential challenge of, of our times. Solving it or not may determine whether human beings as a species get to survive on, on this planet. I hope that this project contributes towards the, the solution, but I also hope that people start recognizing the, the importance of, of the issue and start working towards the solution. R&D is a unique grassroots organization that empowers anyone, anywhere to have a direct impact on the future of our planet. Join those of us who are supporting clean tech research and development that will lead to a sustainable and carbon-free future. Awesome. Um, all right, Ethan, I'll have you take it away and then on your cue, we'll start the movie. Awesome. Thanks, Emily, for introducing R&D to the audience. Um, yeah, I'm happy to introduce the video that we are screening today. It's called The Human Element, which is one of my favorite climate change uh, movies that I've seen. I've seen it a few times over the years. Quite excited to show it. It basically goes through the four elements of life, or quote, elements of life, earth, air, fire, and water, um, how those are changing with climate change and the ways that humans are being affected by those changes and the ways that we are affecting those changes. Um, I think it's a pretty compelling video and will certainly be 
good fodder for an interesting panel discussion following this uh, screening. Um, so yeah, Emily, go ahead and take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Ethan. And we're back. Thanks, everyone. I'll let Ethan take it from here. All right. I'll just give one more minute. OK, looks like we got all the panelists here. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching this video with us. Um, I'm excited and honored today to have uh, leaders from four of the leading climate science and climate action uh, organizations here in the US. Uh, collectively, the panelists, the four panelists, have over 70 years of experience working at the organizations that they're representing today. Um, today, we're, we're going to give the opportunity for panelists to discuss um, their reactions to the video and the great work that they are doing at their orgs. Um, you know, over the past few years, I feel that there's been this public awakening on climate change and people are really starting to understand the gravity and the urgency that we're facing in the climate crisis. However, I think that the way that it's being communicated is quite debilitating. There's a lot of climate doom going around. And um, today, I hope that attendees um, hearing from some of, some of these panelists here um, can, can not only be exposed to you know, the gravity and the urgency of the climate crisis, but also the great work that's being, going, that's being done at a variety of orgs um, taking lead on climate action and how they can get involved and hopefully come away with a sense of optimism around our future and our climate. So um, first, I'm going to give each panelist an opportunity to give a brief introduction to themselves and their organization. I'll start with uh, Brent. Uh, take it away, Brent. Thanks. Hi, thanks for attending. Yeah, I'll be brief. Um, just so you know a little bit about my background, I did a lot of solar cell research early in my career and then uh, moved more into to research operations. Currently, I'm also serving as the uh, uh, science director for R&D. And our, our mission is really, as you saw in the video at the beginning that, that Emily showed, our mission is to fund kind of the difficult to decarbonize sectors of the economy. Um, I'm, I'm proud of our, you know, the work that we've done and, and others to, uh, to make solar cheap and ubiquitous and, and wind. And we need to deploy those technologies as fast and rapidly as possible, but there's gonna be some tough nuts to crack. And that's what R&D is focused on. So we, we don't fund things like solar cell research or nuclear or things like that. We are, we're focused on the difficult to decarbonize uh, areas. Thanks Brent for that introduction. Um, Steve, can you go next, please? Yeah, sure. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me here. I'm Steve Clemmer. I'm the Director of Energy Research and Analysis in the Union of Concerned Scientists Climate and Energy Program. I've been at UCS for nearly 25 years um, that contributed to that total that Ethan was talking about. I'm currently based in Maine, um, but I also worked out of our headquarters in Cambridge, Massachusetts for 10 years. And before that, I was the energy policy coordinator at the Wisconsin Energy Office in Madison, uh, where I also went to grad school and got my master's in energy analysis and policy and land resources from the University of Wisconsin. Um, UCS's mission is to put rigorous independent science to work to solve our planet's most pressing problems. Joining with people across the country, we combine technical analysis and effective advocacy to create innovative practical solutions. U UCS has more than a half a million supporters. Um, we also have a science network of more than 25,000 scientists, engineers, economists, public health specialists, and other experts across the country. 
working to educate the public and inform decision makers on issues that are critical to our health, safety, and environment. Um, science, science Network members um, also work to build power on critical UCS campaigns, including uh, with respect to climate change, um, climate impacts, transitioning to clean energy, holding fossil fuel companies accountable. Uh, my understanding is that Omar and Brent are both members of our scientific network, so maybe they can say more than I can about how it works. But anyways, um, lastly, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, the climate and energy program at UCS is by far the biggest program. It's about 40% of the organization. Um, but we also have programs on clean transportation and food in the environment. Um, both of those also work on this climate related issues. We also have a global security program that's working to reduce nuclear weapons and the, reduce, and the risk of nuclear war. That goes back to uh, uh, when UCS was founded in the late 60s by some professors at, UC, um, at MIT. Um, in addition, we have the Center for Science and Democracy and that works to promote independent science a responsive, transparent democracy, and evidence-based decision-making on issues that affect public health and safety. So I'll stop there, thanks. Thanks, Steve, for that great introduction to yourself and the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, next up, we've got Omar uh, to represent March for Science. Hey, everybody, thank you for, for having me. Uh, it's, it's good to be here. That's a really powerful movie. Uh, so my name is Omar Guayid. I'm a postdoctoral fellow over at the Naval Research Lab, uh, funded through the National Academies of Science. Uh, I got my PhD in material science uh, from NYU. Uh, my field is essentially shooting lasers at nanoparticles. You can use that in order to make uh, materials such as solar cells, but also medicines, dyes, uh, et cetera. So my uh, involvement with March for Science is I'm the co-founder and treasurer of March for Science New York City. Uh, we are a, a org of scientists, volunteers, and friends that our main focus is evidence-based policy as Steve uh, introduced, but a human-centered, democracy-centered, human rights-centered evidence-based policy. So for example, uh, we recently, uh, we pretty much yearly get funding from the Union of Concerned Scientists uh, for our STEM the Vote program, where we uh, get, you know, we're trying to get scientists uh, to register to vote because uh, STEM students are the lowest uh, uh, voting uh, block of all students, but also get the general public out to vote uh, and to get them to vote for science. We don't tell them who to vote for, but what to vote for, you know, vote for evidence based policies such as uh, single payer healthcare or uh, you know, fighting climate change or pub better public transportation or, you know, uh, combating crime, uh, not by increasing the prison population and, and doing things that aren't evidence-based, but by actually investing in evidence-based community-based solutions to crime. So that's that's sort of the concept behind Mark for Science. Uh, and I, I'm looking forward to talking more in a bit. Thanks, Omar. Sorry, thanks, Omar, for your great introduction. Um, uh, Ellen, last but not least, can you give an intro to yourself and Noah? Sure. Well, thanks, Ethan, for having me. And thanks to my panelists, um, or our panelists. It's really exciting to be here, and I'm glad I'm excited to talk to you guys. Um, so my name is Ellen McRae, and I am the Regional Climate Services Director for NOAA's Eastern Region. Um, my territory goes from Maine through South Carolina, and I've been um, working with states in the eastern region for the last 12 years, uh, really helping them to understand and access NOAA's climate information to make their own planning and environmental decisions. Um, before that, um, I've been in Washington, D.C., working in the policy side. And uh, before that, I was a seagoing oceanographer. And uh, I, I wonder some days if I should have given that up. <laughs> Um, but anyway, I spent about a decade going to sea and looking at, um, I'm, I'm a geologist by training and an uh, earth scientist, and so I spent time uh, looking at paleoclimate records and contamination records offshore of New York and um, Boston Harbor, as well as Lake Baikal in Russia. Um, so uh, some, some great science there. Um, I think that uh, NOAA has three primary missions. Um, our missions have to do with our research and science. 
uh, both our internal research having to do with um, examining satellite information, but also our work to improve the weather forecast and the weather service, which is a portion of NOAA. Um, we also do a lot of work examining uh, our nation's oceans and coastlines uh, in the ocean service portion of NOAA. Um, and we have ships and aircraft, which, as you know, fly through our hurricanes and are examining the path and nature of hurricane development. Um, we have research in um, severe storms based in Norman, Oklahoma, um, looking at tornadoes and all kinds of other severe events. Um, we also have one of the world famous um, global climate modeling centers in Princeton, New Jersey at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab. Um, so we're a combination of our science as well as our services, and that's the arm that I'm in, having to do with the interpretation of our climate information for, as I said, states, but also for the different sectors of the U.S. economy. So we recently did an examination of where our climate information is, is being used, and we can basically document that NOAA's climate science is the trusted source um, for all the federal agencies to use as a baseline, as well as all of the sectors of the US economy. So we also provide funding. We have, an, uh, um, as, as has been said by FEMA and some of our other federal partners, we have an unprecedented amount of federal funding um, heading towards the climate problem right now um, in the capital B for billions that we've literally never seen as scientists. Um, so in the film, when it says, I've never seen this before, I'm like, no, no, really, I've never seen this before. Um, so it is sort of a, a career high um, as we think about what we're going to spend um, this money on when it comes to changing infrastructure. And as the folks in the coal communities have said, it's up to the humans to, uh, to really change the path that we're on. Um, we have the ingenuity and the understanding and just have to put that to work. Um, so NOAA does also fund SBIR work or small business work, which I hope that um, ORD will take advantage of. I've talked to Ethan about that. <laughs> and um, I guess lastly, I'll just say that I've been um, the region's, um, what we call the coordinating lead author for the National Climate Assessment. And I've been doing that now for the third, fourth, and currently the fifth uh, National Climate Assessment. I'll stop there. Awesome. Uh, thanks, thanks all panelists for your great intros. Um, we'll get started into the questions. I'll do my best to um, address the questions coming in from our attendees, as well as the ones that I've pre-prepared for today's discussion. Um, Want to start with a question to everyone. Um, I'll direct it at Ellen first. Um, and that's just what stories from the video resonated with you most? So um, I guess one of the features of being um, a climate scientist, but also a climate scientist uh, directly committed to the services and the delivery of our information is I actually know a lot of those guys in those videos. <laughs> um, so I've worked with folks in West Virginia. Um, I've worked with Skip Stiles in, Vir in Virginia. I've worked with the Norfolk folks on sea level rise. Um, and so we've worked on Tanger Island. Um, and you saw um, in the air video some of our colleagues in the climate in the chemical sciences lab out in Boulder that work on our air, uh, the chemistry of our air. So I know a lot of those guys. We've heard the stories, and I think it's a really complicated set of answers. Um, I was texting Ethan during the video and talking about. Um, a conference that we call the Managed Retreat Conference at Columbia University in New York. We've hosted that um, with Columbia or sponsored it with Columbia in 2019 and again in virtually in 2021, hashtag pandemic. Um, and so um, in both of those instances, you know, the, the water issue, especially in Tangier, um, has a number of concerns and we see this all over the country. Um, it's combination of protecting the communities that we know and we have relationships with. And it's also thinking about the, you know, coastal tax bases um, and everything in between. Um, I was just talking with the National Climate Assessment author in the Midwest and he's like, you know, you coastal people that have your houses, you know, a half a mile from the coast, you know, that's the problem. 
<laughs> it's like there's a lot to that statement. So uh, there are state. It really has to do with taxes, with people's largest investment of their life, mostly having to do with their homes. Um, it's about emergency management, and do we tell emergency managers that they no longer have to serve these areas? And they really can't do that. <laughs> it goes against the. Stafford Act, it goes against the, you know, public services and the availability of safety and service. So uh, it's a tough, tough nut to crack. And so I encourage you guys to take a look at the managed retreat videos um, and see some of the dialogue on those hard choices. Thanks, Ellen. Um, Omar, I'm curious, were there any stories in the, in the video that stuck out to you? Uh, the conversation about you know pivoting from coal to uh, renewables. So that was a, a so I interned in a metals factory in West Virginia for a summer uh, as a material scientist. And you know one of the uh, main uses of the metals that were being processed there were the fossil fuel industry. Uh, and one of the tests that we were running was you know uh, one of the tests that I had was you know, does uh, clean coal, quote unquote, um, you know, what are some of the joints that we can use uh, for the welding in clean coal? And just to make it clear, this quote unquote clean coal uh, ripped through super nickel alloy as if it was Swiss cheese. Uh, so it is not clean at all, just to, you know, make it absolutely clear. So, you know, of course, because this is happening, these are some of the results that are coming up. A lot of the conversations that are happening are about uh, switching to renewable energy and, you know, people's livelihoods, their families' livelihoods are in the fossil fuel industry. So the conversation about, well, you know, you will still have a job, like you working in the metals factory, metals industry, your job is just going to switch to, you know, airfoils for wind turbines, as well as, you know, uh, uh, support structures for solar cells. And, you know, there's so many different uses for metals beyond the fossil fuel industry. But that's that conversation of you know transitioning from fossil fuels to renewable in the West Virginia area has is, is been a hot topic issue for years. So that's not like a, a, a new realization, but it's something interesting to see you know displayed on, on in a movie. Yeah, absolutely. As we talk about the transition from you know fossil fuel jobs to clean jobs. You know, it's important to acknowledge that, okay, maybe there's more jobs in the clean energy industry, but are they available to the communities that were being supported by opportunities in, uh, in fossil fuel industry? So certainly an important and evolving <laughs> topic for sure. Thanks for uh, highlighting that one. Um, Steve, um, any stories that yeah, definitely. There are many in there, but a couple that stood out to me. Um, one was about Tanger Island. Um, I've spent the last 15 years living on or near the coast of Maine, um, most recently near Acadia National Park. And there are more than 4,000 islands along Maine's 3,500 mile coastline. When you look at all the ins and outs, um, only 15 of them support year round populations. But um, you can see the visual behind me on the map is uh, some of the islands near Portland and Casco Bay. Um, but islands like Vinyl Haven and many coastal towns in Maine are faced with very similar problems as Tangier Island. Um, Maine's iconic $1.4 billion lobster industry is also project projected to significantly decline over time from both from increasing water temperatures, but also ocean acidification. A recent study showed that water temperatures in the Gulf of Maine are warming faster than 99% of the global oceans. Um, the other story that kind of stood out to me was what we were just talking about in terms of the economic impact on coal communities and the need for just transition. Um, the segments in the film um, that featured Barbara Freeze, um, she, I actually had the pleasure of working very closely with her for for many years at UCS, um, and uh, we, we co-authored several reports together. We also worked um, on numerous policies and regulatory efforts to help prevent 
roughly 150 new coal plants from being built in the US. Um, at one point in time, there was actually 150 coal plant proposals, um, if you can believe that, and, but also to make the case for replacing coal with renewables. Um, also along those lines, I worked very closely with a, with a guy named Jeremy Richardson um, at ECS. Um, he comes from a third generation coal mining family in West Virginia. So some of the stories about that in the film are very similar to some of his stories. And he was very passionate about ensuring a just and equitable transition for coal communities while being a very um, enthusiastic and avid uh, advocate for addressing climate change. Um, he recently left UCS and is at, at RMI now, but that was also something that really kind of uh, hit home to me. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, you and uh, Ellen both mentioned Tangier Island, managed retreat, adapting to the changing climate and the rising waters. I think in, in that story, what stuck out to me the first time I watched the video was um, the scene where they're looking at this tiny little intersection, like a three-way intersection uh, near the coast, uh, right outside of a church. And they said that they paid a million dollars to raise that by a foot or two. And I think that to me put into perspective just the amount of dollars that are needed to adapt to climate change and rising sea level. Um, a million dollars for one intersection, that, that was kind of hard to swallow for me. Um, Brent, how about, uh, we'll give the stage to you for your reactions to the video, any stories that you found compelling? Well, I think just the big one locally is we had, and it really hits home, is, is the fire. We had uh, the Marshall Fire here a few months ago in Colorado. It's the 10th most expensive fire in US history. And let's put this in perspective. It happened in hours, right? Thousand homes gone in, in hours, not days. It just blew through the town. And we have a board member, I think she's on the line even, who, uh, who literally had the fire surround her house. So a block away in three directions and homes were just vaporized. And fortunately for, for her, um, she, her house was saved. I mean, it was, the fire was kind of wind direction changed and they were able to get in and put, put fires out, but, uh, but her neighbors were not so lucky. So that was literally in our backyard in, in Superior, Colorado here. And, uh, but, but it was just stunning. A thousand homes gone in a few hours. Um, unbelievable. In, in December, right? Yeah. Right, in the winter. Yeah, that was absolutely wild. And <laughs> I think we were all hoping for a better fire season this year in Colorado, given how bad the air quality was this year over the summer and, and the last year before that. And so having that huge fire in December was pretty devastating <laughs> morally, I think. Yeah, no, it's just crazy. So the whole fire thing was just freaky. Um, I just have a logistics question. Ellen is putting a lot of really good links in the, uh, in the chat here. Emily, will you be able to save those off and get those to us? For those of us that can't pay attention as fast as she's cutting and pasting. <laughs> yeah, I'll be able to share um, all the links and important anecdotes that we share in the chat um, right. after the call. Sorry. Uh, we, so our job is to provide the information. What you guys do with it for your decisions is your thing. So I'm going to give you a lot of material to think about. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Ellen. And thanks, uh, Brent, for keeping us in line. Um, I'm curious. Um, if each of you can talk about just quickly the ways that you think climate change has affected you and your families and your friends in your local communities, um, perhaps in the past few years. Um, Brent, you, you talked about the fire. Do you have anything to add to that? Or Well, I spent a lot of time out in the woods in Colorado and I can just see it drying out and I can see you know, invasive species just going much faster and faster than when I was a kid. And uh, just, you know, I, I see it in, you know, every forest in the country is stressed. And um, so I, I, I see it whenever I go out into the woods, that's a personal thing. And then the air quality, I mean, we even, I even know of labs 
where they use ozone is a re very reactive chemical. It's used in some chemistry processes. And, um, and so they have ozone generators, that are, but they have ozone detection in the lab. And so they shut down if they detect ozone. Well, just the background ozone sometimes gets so high that it shuts their experiment down. So you know the whole air quality and, and the change of nature is certainly something that hits me. Uh, I've seen it personally. So what you're saying there is that the intent of those ozone protections are if ozone is being generated by your experiment to shut down the experiment. Well, well it's, it's generated within a controlled atmosphere. Yep. But if it gets out of a controlled reactor, for instance, then that's what the detection is there for. But the ambient ozone gets so high, especially in fire season, that sometimes experiments get shut down. So it's crazy. Yeah, and, and, and of course, there's all sorts of reports about how in, in Colorado that, that that air quality is disproportionately affecting the, the lower income communities, right? So so we, we have to pay attention to that. But so that's, that's what those are the things I see locally. Thanks, Brent. Um, Steve, you mentioned um, like sea level rise and weather events in Maine. Do you want to expand upon that or talk about anything else? Yeah, definitely. I, ironically, earlier today, I, I literally witnessed coastal flooding uh, from storm surge from extreme weather, literally in my backyard, as well as in my local community. Um, as Ellen knows, we, we had a nor'easter uh, with several inches of rain and wind gusts up to 65 miles an hour. And that resulted in flooding um, with waves you know, spilling onto several local roads, including, uh, including in Acadia National Park, which I live near. Um, and a lot of this obviously was occurring during high tide, but I've definitely noticed an increase in the frequency and severity of these types of events and impacts um, during the time I've lived here. Um, one other quick story I just wanna tell is, um, I also worked in Glacier National Park in college in the late 1980s and spent pretty much all my days off hiking and climbing the highest mountains in Glacier. And of the 26 named glaciers in the park um, have apparently lost about 40 to 80% of their area over the past 50 years and are projected to mostly disappear by 2030. And I've been back there several times, including a few years ago with my kids, and I can clearly see the changes um, and can compare them to pictures I took in the late 80s. Um, if you haven't been there, I highly recommend going as soon as you can before they're gonna have to rename the park to something else. So do so if you haven't been there. It's really sad to see the disappearing natural beauty around the world with you know ecosystems dying, coral reefs dying in, in Australia and uh, you, you mentioned glaciers receding. Um, yeah, thanks, Steve. How about uh, Omar? It's funny that you mentioned coral reefs. Uh, you know, I, uh, Egyptian of origin, I, I go back um, pretty often uh, to Egypt to go, you know, snorkeling in, in the Red Sea is something that Egyptians do quite regularly. It's only a few hours away from Cairo. And, you know, seeing, I, you know, in my lifetime, I remember, you know, swimming and, and seeing beautiful corals and whatnot, coming back a couple of years later, and then they're bleached or a portion of them are bleached uh, to where your favorite little reef is now a fraction of what it was in color. Uh, so that, that was, that's something that, you know, hit my head is, uh, I, I only made the connection right now that that was, uh, while we're talking, actually, it was, uh, memory of coral reefs and uh you know growing up every year being like oh this is worse than last year this is worse than last year yeah but i mean it, obviously I'm, I'm a new yorker um you know seeing the uh mega storms that are hitting new york uh, for example sandy like we're still recovering like my back uh yard in, in new york is on the hudson and on the hudson you know there there's a construction project that just finished that was reconstructing from sandy uh, and that's not including the subway flooding that, or the, you know, Queens flooding. We fundamentally just haven't in the, you know, wealthiest city in our country, we don't have the infrastructure in order to combat climate change or, or mitigate or, or even handle the effects of climate change right now. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's a, 
pretty stark warning sign for the rest of the country, if, if you ask me. Thanks, Omar. And last but not least, uh, Ellen, I'd love to hear your, your views as a climate scientist here. So I call it riding the sine wave of climate science. Uh, sometimes it's cool, sometimes it's not cool. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's totally depressing. Um, you guys are totally depressing me, so I'm gonna go for the <laughs> I'm gonna go for the winners and losers aspect of climate um, and tell you some of the interesting stories that I've heard. Um, one is from the uh, fisherman in Maine that bought the first cat share for black sea bass. Never seen that before in Maine. Um, so he was the first to jump in on catching it and making some money. Um, moving away from the traditional lobstering and looking at what's coming northward. Um, so another winner and loser, striped bass in the Chesapeake, but now they're striped bass in Massachusetts. <laughs> so we call them something different, you know, rockfish versus striper. Um, but anyway, the gist is that some of the fish are moving further north. Um, my husband grows a fig tree in our yard on Cape Cod. That is another winner loser thing. It is very unusual to have a fig tree that produces fruit uh, in the fall. And uh, he wraps it carefully in the winter. But nevertheless, the fact that it survives is unbelievable. Um, birds that we haven't seen before, you know, you can thank Rachel Carson, but um, we see more osprey and bald eagle on the East Coast in, in the last decade than I've seen ever before on the East Coast. So huge um, osprey nests all over Cape Cod. Um, we even put little cameras in them so we can watch them. Um, <laughs> um, just a number of phenological changes um, that, that we can document in terms of changes in the food and habitat of different species. What we're seeing and what we're not seeing, um, I think is a real indicator of of the shifts that we're seeing. And that includes nasty things like ticks um, that never die in the winter anymore. And so you have to dose your dog or, um, you know, however you take care of those. But, uh, but we do that all year round now. Um, so there's, you can definitely see it in your lifetime. In fact, we have a project with Climate Central that also works with the TV meteorologists. TV meteorologists, as we know, uh, well, you may not know, but a lot of them actually don't believe in climate. So it's kind of interesting and fun. <laughs> um, so TV meteorologists deal in the here and now and meteorology and the weather time scale deals with things basically out to two weeks. After two weeks, you know, it takes on a different turn and takes on the more climate time scale, the planning horizon, what we can expect in the next decade or two decades. So we have a project to introduce, say, ticks or phenology changes or things like observed changes in terms of real graphics that TV meteorologists can post because they're still the ones that reach, you know, Google and grandma, as we say. So because they're reaching all of these audiences, it's a really effective means to communicate what we're seeing in terms of a changing climate. So I throw that out there as a cool project. Thanks, Ellen. Um, yeah, so so I want to be conscious of time. Um, I think we'll try to keep keep to the next fifteen minutes uh, for the remainder of the panel. And so I think we have enough time to ask a multi-part question. Um, I'll ask a, a unique one to each person, um, just to keep us on track. So I'll start with Omar. Um, so, so I want to pivot to kind of the intent of the panel, which is to talk about the role of science and scientists in climate action. So uh, on your website, it says we use science to make, sorry, no, that is the wrong one. Join us as we fight uh, for science informed public policies around the world. Um, so, so I think when most people think about science and scientists and climate change, they think of people like Ellen uh, who are quantifying and studying what you know what the climate science is telling us but past that more than just saying the climate climate change is real and this is what's happening um what is the your organization's uh use of science to uh create action 
So, I mean, we break it down ultimately to that scientists are people. And as people, they exist in communities. I know it's it's a crazy concept, right? As people, we exist in communities, right? And so uh, some communities are communities of color, some are indigenous communities, some are uh, immigrant communities. And so you can't do good science if you're afraid, if your cousins are locked in cages. You can't do good science if uh, your family's land is being dispossessed. You can't do good science if you know, you're living in an area that is being polluted and traditionally in America's, you know, system, uh, black and brown communities are more heavily polluted than uh, other communities. You can't do good science if you are afraid of the police locking you up. So our, our main focus is to use evidence-based policy. You know, we have people who study immigration. We have people who study how to make our community safer. We have people who study healthcare policy. We have people who study you know, uh, frontline communities and how to make sure that, uh, you know, they're represented in the climate conversations. And so why don't we, A, bring the activists from those communities forward and unite them with the scientists who study, uh, and oftentimes it's one and the same, uh, and, and, you know, have these conversations that sort of inform people what is evidence-based policy that puts community first. A lot of times uh, highlighting uh, community activist voices and a lot of times that's community activists, scientists voices uh, to make sure that we can you know, push forward evidence-based policy that helps us all. Uh, so that's, that's sort of March for Science in a nutshell. Thanks, Omar. And uh, the second part to the question is, what is what one campaign that your organization is focusing on this year? And a uh, third part of the question is, if people want to get involved with March for Science or March for Science New York City, um, how do they do so? Uh, sure. So uh, first of all, how to get involved, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to me by email, omar at marchforscience.newyorkcity. We are seriously just a handful of scientists who are volunteering our time and friends who are volunteering our time. So uh, just reach out to me by email and I'll, I'll hook you up. Um, a campaign that I'm really proud of this year is our um, is, is the concept of abolition uh, climate science. So as many of you know, uh, New York City is, uh, we recently had uh, an election in which, uh, you know, our mayor is very pro, uh, he's a, a former police officer, and he's very pro increasing the police presence in the city. Uh, and he's actually doing that at the cost of our housing, our education, uh, et cetera. So he's increasing funding to the police while you know, decreasing funding or defunding uh, or keeping those funding flat for the rest of our uh, city. So the concept is that actually doesn't keep us safe. There's no evidence that this keeps us safe or increases safety. Uh, and you know, one clear example of this is you know, our city just had a mass shooting for the first time in, in a long time. Uh, and this was in a police populated area. So the salute, and after increasing the police in the MTA by, you know, X percent, it's some crazy number. So why are we doing this? Why aren't we investing in our community? Why are we building prisons instead of building climate uh, solutions and, and, you know, building better climate resiliency and climate infrastructure? Why aren't we, you know, making sure that our schools are COVID safe? Uh, so that's sort of our, our approach to this is, you know, this is a campaign that we're really proud of is, you know, taking on, uh, uh, you know, following the Black Leadership Farm Movement uh, and making sure that we can combat systemic racism while making our city safer through evidence-based policy of increasing housing, healthcare, education access. Thanks, Omar, for that great uh, introduction to your org and what you're working on this year. Um, I, I love how you highlight you know, the scientists as people um, being affected by the political events that are um, facing them in their communities. It reminds me of the work of Dr. Lisa Cook that I came across with, I don't know, a few years back called Patent Racism, which talked about, um, it basically studied the number of patents uh, that were coming out of the black community 
over time and how like political tensions within the black community caused you know a change in um, the amount of patents coming out of that community so that, that was a really interesting work that i'd recommend to look at it if you haven't seen it i'll have to check it out i haven't seen yeah. it now <laughs> um yes yeah, steve I, i'd love to um ask you a similar question to omar so on on your website you you state we use science to make change happen um how does your organization do this what does it look like for you yeah well i think there's there's basically four main ways that we use science to make change happen um first we conduct rigorous independent research and analysis on both climate impacts and solutions. Um, as part of that, we also amplify other credible scientific research and economic analysis from the IPCC, from NOAA, and other federal agencies, academics, other NGOs. Um, second, we fight misinformation from the fossil fuel industry and defend science against political and industry attacks. Third, we communicate with the media, public, and decision makers about climate impacts and solutions at a variety of different levels, the national level, state level, and even the local level. And then finally, and, and perhaps most importantly, we mobilize our 500,000 supporters and scientific network members to advocate for change. And just to give you just a concrete example of, uh, of this, um, Last year, during Earth, uh, Earth Day Summit, um, UCS engaged 1,500 scientists to sign on to a letter calling on the U.S. to set strong targets for reducing its carbon emissions by at least 50% below 2005 levels by 2030 under the Paris Agreement. And that message was received by the White House um, in adopting the target of 50 to 52% at the Earth Day Summit last year, the White House cited support from thousands of scientists, um, and now we're actively working to shape the legislation that can help deliver on that commitment. So just one example of many. Thanks, Steve. And if people want to be involved uh, with your org, how can they? Well, um, you can become a member. Um, or a science network member, um, you can go to our website and sign up for those things. Um, you can also get on our mailing list um, and take action. Um, there's a, several things on our website that you can take action on related to specific policies and, and scientific topics. Um, I can send around some more information about the science network if that's helpful as well. I can put that in the chat. Uh, yeah, please do, and we'll disseminate it to all the attendees. Thank you. Um, yeah, Brent, um, what did I prepare for you? So we all know we need more wind, solar, and electric vehicles, but past that, um, are there any new technologies that are still needed to get to net zero emissions? Yeah, tons actually. Um, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, like a lot of building materials, uh, the manufacturing and, the, and concrete and steel and, and uh, a lot of refrigerants in the building sector are, are, you know, leaks are a big problem. Just so there's lots of technology that are needed um, to, to, to get to a zero emissions platform. I think that Howard had a question in the chat there about what about sequestration? Um, I think R&D's take on that is that, um, that, the, that the agricultural community with reforestation and, you know, mixing forests with crops and, uh, and carbon sequestering crops probably is going to do more than technology. So we're not, nobody's convinced us yet that, that uh, using technology to sequester carbon is the way to go, but, but use, you know, especially if, if maybe at, at a source where you have a, a lot of carbon being produced, you know, if we get rid of fossil fuel electricity plants, then we don't have those sources where it's concentrated. You want to mine gold where there's a lot of gold. You want to mine carbon where there's a lot of carbon. Um, so we, so, you know, if we, if in the long term we get rid of burning fossil fuels, then those sources that, that are probably easier to mine are not part of it. But um, so we're, we're really focused on 
I'm eliminating carbon from the economy with new, with technology. We, we leave the Union of Concerned Scientists and uh, and other advocacy, you know, National Resource Defense Council and, and other places to do the politics and the and the and the policy stuff, which is equally as important. But uh, but we need people deploying technologies. We need people, uh, you know, changing policy. We need people educating. But they all need new technology to to finish the race. So that's really what R and D is about is that the, the difficult technologies that we can't just deploy tomorrow. And can you give us a 30 second overview of the, uh, the project that we just recently awarded funding to? Yeah, so basically it's scientists at the University of Kentucky. When we do it, it's very similar to SBIRs. And I think there's uh, some other panelists in here that are former SBIR and funding agent folks, but. We do a similar thing, you know. We put out a request for proposals and we review them at, uh, uh, for technical merit. And the, the University of Kentucky one, and they're looking at converting uh, various forms of, of oils and wastes to sustainable aviation fuels with low low cost catalysts in a sustainable way that are deployable, uh, geographically distributed, so that people can take waste streams and locally convert them to, to aviation fuel, which is, it's really gonna be really hard to electrify the, that sector. Um, so that, that was our last, that was that recent uh, award. Thanks Brent. And if people want to be involved with R&D, how can they? Well, we don't have membership yet, but we do, we do accept donations and we do, um, we are looking for volunteers in a variety of ways. We're looking for technical experts in, in, the, in our technology areas, transportation, uh, uh, agriculture, uh, buildings. And, and so we're looking for, for, uh, for volunteers to give technical expertise in those areas. And then um, also just with you know, public relations and, and PR and, and copy, you know, putting out materials. And so we'll take, if you have a skill that you can apply to, to things that R&D does, uh, you know, we're looking for, for volunteers for sure. Thanks, Brent. Um, I'd like to uh, ask a question to Ellen now. Um, so in, in the course of studying the climate over the past few decades, um, what stuck out to you the most? Um, what was perhaps the most surprising thing uh, that, that you found over the past uh, 30 years or so that you've been working in this field? Yeah, I guess I'm a big chunk of that 70 years of experience. <laughs> um, so thank you. Uh, and I, so I actually, Ethan, went out to, to my colleagues to, to talk about this question a little bit because you know when you're in the science and you're sort of head down, it's hard to think about like what what surprised you? I'm like, oh, you know, I mean, in the weather service, I was like, I could have predicted that, right? You know, that's, so, so it's how do you turn that around into what surprised us? And so I'd say one of the things that have get, some of the things that have given us hope. And so this is like my climate services colleagues around the country. There's six of us uh, that manage the regions around the U.S. Um, and I'd say the thing that was most surprising are the advances that we've seen in terms of tracing. Um, the pollutants and the changes. So, you know, going to these meetings where people can trace the origin of the oil and gas and where they're used um, the most and who the sources are, you know, that's from Exxon and that's from Shell. Um, it's actually very interesting. And so, you know, it's a, it's a scientific means of combating the messaging that we are hearing. Um, that was fascinating to me. Um, the other thing is just the source of optimism that we have in terms of the, I mean, so I told you we, we ride the sine wave, if you will, but we also see the real gains that our states are making to move from the planning phase to the implementation phase, if you will. And so really where states are taking charge of, of their own 
destiny is probably too powerful, <laughs> but uh, they're taking charge and they're taking action. And so much so that we've actually put this into the national assessment in the Northeast chapter, um, feeling like our states are making a huge difference on the ground, making the changes that they need to make both in terms of adaptation uh, and mitigation. We've also taken new steps in the in the national assessment this this time around to think about what it means to change markets. Um, how are we going to make this monumental shift? Like where, you know, do you hit people where it hurts, so to speak, or you know, how does that work? Um, and we're seeing some real advances in the bond market, for example, and the origin of green bonds and how people are financing this kind of work. Um, but we've also seen changes in the insurance industry and how they're um, really taking into account a lot of our science. And so it's been a really wonderful partnership between us and several of the uh, U.S. insurance companies that are using our information to make changes on the ground. And um, that, that may force some of the changes that we've talked about along the coast um, and other things. So I think there's a lot happening. It's all happening really fast. Um, I mean, relatively speaking, I work for the federal government, right? So <laughs> it's happening fast, really, it is. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I, I think I can try to maintain my optimistic outlook and say that the things that have surprised me are the human ingenuity that we're, that we're witnessing. I know, Omar, my hat was for you because this was March for Science in Boston. <laughs> I appreciate the hat. I remember, uh, I remember that like big release of hats for the Marshall Science movement. It, it was like a, a real push for it, and I'm so I'm <laughs> yeah, happy yeah. that someone still has the hat. <laughs> yeah. So we have the things when we went virtual, right? We all had to wear different hats, and I was like, "Well, I'm gonna wear my brain hat." <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ellen, for that optimism. I think we all needed it um, to some degree, and um, you know, it, it's fun to see how much our paths have crossed between our different orgs. Um, you know, Steve and Ellen both saying that they knew people from the video and um, perhaps most or all of us have been to one or several of the March for Science uh, events over the years. Um, yeah, I, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today and uh, our distinguished panelists for offering your expertise um, to, to this event. I, I think it's been really fruitful. I've certainly learned a lot from you all. Um, we're going to collect all of the links that have been shared here, um, as well as take snippets of this panel and make it available for people's viewing um, after the, the fact. Um, we did co-host this event with March for Science New York City. So thank you to Omar. Um, I do want to give you, Omar, a, a chance to um, tell us about the couple of events that you have got coming up later this week. Absolutely. So we have uh, teamed up with Earth Day Initiative. We have, and, and thank you, Ethan, and, and it's great to, to partner with R&D. It's, it's, uh, it's always awesome to have a new friend, right? And so uh, we're teaming up with Earth Day Initiative this Thursday to have a um, a rally both in Union Square, but also a live stream that we're gonna air on our uh, platform. So we're gonna cross post it uh, with uh, Earth Day Initiative, March for Science Global, ACT TV uh, has agreed to get involved and, and help cross post it. Uh, so, you know, tune in, uh, follow us on, on Facebook and, and tune in, it'll, it'll show up on your screen, it'll be all day. Um, we have a lot of great speakers for that. Alexander Villasenor, a lot of uh, uh, politicians, celebrities. I think we just got uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt uh, to agree to speak on there. And, and uh, Adam Schiff is apparently him and Joseph Gordon-Levitt had a bit of a, a love affair on, uh, on the chat. It was a, a very cute, uh, it was as reminisced, a very cute uh, uh, panel. So tune in. Uh, the we also have on the ground Saturday in New York City. We're going to meet up uh, 72nd and uh, Central Park West uh, at, at 12 o'clock. We're going to have a rally, uh, really good speakers as well. Uh, we're going to have another march. Uh, this one we're going to go uh, basically past uh, down Broadway uh, and into Bryant Park. We have some great partners there. 
one of them. Our R and D's uh, agreed to partner with us, and, and really appreciate that. Uh, it's actually a great place to, to reach out to scientists because that's half of our uh, half of the people who show up to our events. So uh, hopefully, you can get some some new grant uh, applications from them. And uh, and you know, scientists from Extinction Rebellion, uh, you know, Sunrise Movement. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of varying scientific organizations that are going to show up and, and activist organization or, uh, that are going to show up and uh, make some noise because as you know you know there's all this activism that's happening all year round all the science is happening all year round uh, you know you do need to take a moment to celebrate it but also to reflect it highlight it and and make these uh, network and make these connections and what better way to do it than a rally in a march. Absolutely agree. It's such a fun event to show up to March for Science. So thanks, Omar. Um, Thank you. Yeah, uh, well, I want to wish everyone a happy Earth Day and thank all of our panelists again. Thank March for Science New York City for uh, their co-hosting of the event. Emily for hosting. Um, it's certainly been a pleasure. Uh, Emily, is there anything we need to do to end this event? I don't know how to do it. <laughs> Can I, I think leave? we're we're all good. Um, big shout out to Ethan and all of you guys. Thanks for joining us. And um, yeah, we're excited for all the rest of the events for the rest of Earth Week and the rest of the year. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.